So how are you guys enjoying the conference so far, the summit? Good information? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so basically what we're going to do right now is just have a conversation. A conversation about what's really um, causing problems in a cooperative ecosystem. One of the one of the many, but the most pronounced headache that we we are experiencing um, in building cooperatives rapidly. So we're gonna have a little conversation about money and um, and capitalism and why they are winning and what we can do um, to win, as our president likes to say. <laughs> um, because we're all about winning, right? I mean, we, we've been working hard for a very long time, um, and we're, we're, we're taking these baby steps. And these baby steps are um, causing us to be in a situation where it takes six years to build a food co-op, where I can go into a bank and put up a house and have the half a million dollars in funding to build a, a, a grocery store, a million dollars in funding in a matter of two months, right? Uh, so one of our major problems, one of the problems that we have is money. Our weakness is money. So disclaimer, until about two years ago, all of my friends would have told me, told you guys, I'm a capitalist, right? Um, so I traveled the world for six years, investing in fish farming and coffee exports. I embraced the capitalist model. My introduction to, to cooperatives was working with the cooperative ag, uh, um, the, the agricultural cooperatives that dominate the, the coffee industry. So if you buy coffee, most likely it's coming from a cooperative. Um, but during that experience, I, I learned a few things. And it changed the way that I look at wealth in America, or it changed the way that I look at the way we finance business in America and how money can be used um, for the good of all. So who here don't like money? <laughs> right? Okay. So money is, money is why we wake up and we go to work often. Um, we live in a capitalist society. So if we, are, if we stay in this room and ignore the fact that we are in the midst of a capitalist society, we will not be able to take advantage of the tools that currently exist. And we can, we can talk about this utopian dream, right? But that's here, the situation is here, right? So how can we take the dreams of building this, this socialist or this cooperative ecosystem, this utopia that works for all, using the tools that exist now? Right? And the tools that exist now are designed for capitalists, right? And if we just look at capitalists as a whole, uh, we look at, let's say, everyone know Uber, right? We look at Uber, that's a capitalist company, correct? Right? We can all agree, it's a capitalist company. What makes them capitalists? Profit market. Profit market. Okay, profit driven. Kind of extractive in terms of their labor model, so a lot of their profits are extracted from the laborers, the drivers who don't have a lot of benefits or um, mm -hmm. share on them. What? What are? That's not what they really are. What they've done is they've exploited the whole thing in the marketplace, mm -hmm. and that's the essence of capitalism: is to provide an added value. If they didn't do that, they wouldn't exist. Yep. So we can't just say they exploit work. They don't. Not just the time. Uh -huh. they're, they're, they're losing money, but they're valued at like three billion dollars. You're on to something. <laughs> the way that all of these startups are operating is not based upon like the traditional valuations, right? You're making a certain amount of money, therefore you're worth a certain amount of money. Um, if I sold you, this is just a, a dumbed down version. If you said, here's a piece of paper, 
I'll sell it, I'll sell it to you for ten dollars. You give me ten dollars for the, of that, right? Um, and I say, you know what? That's going to be worth more. And you say, you know what? I'm going to pass it to what's your name? Tracy back there. And Tracy buys it for you for fifteen dollars. And by the time this messaging, by the time it gets to the back of the room, it's maybe worth three hundred dollars. Just a number thrown out of there. All the time, it's really worth nothing, right? And in a startup ecosystem, when you see these valuations, I mean, we have we have WeWork here, a matter of blocks away, the, the the number one startup company in America owns almost zero property, long term lease, the most valued startup right now um, is losing money. It's because there's people who believe that they're going to be worth something one day. Right. Just like right? Amazon. Yes. It lasts um, for quite a few years. Exactly. That's the startup ecosystem in a nutshell. And I have no problem with a person making profit. If your goal is to make money and you make money, congratulations, you did your job well. Okay? That's just not my goal. Now what I look at, coming from my background, I'm traditionally business trained, and I, I spent a lot of time strictly looking at ways that I can extract profit from the world. Um, the problem with that is that if we're looking at profit, in a traditional sense of, of the word profit, um, it's always extracted. There is no way to make a profit without it being extracted, without extracting value from somewhere. So we have a situation right now in Chicago where um, a new grocery store is opening up in South Shore, in the old Dominic space, right? This grocery store was offered about $10 million in TIF funding. And the building cost $20 million. So the commission basically said, you buy the building, we give you $10 million in TIF funding. The buyer came back, which is a uh, shop and save, I want to say. The buyer came back, like, no, we need more tip money, right? Um, and they're looking at this as community development. So you, how could a for-profit business be community development if profit in itself is extractive? So if you're going to open up a grocery store in a specific area, and you're going with the intention of making profit, that means you must undervalue your workers. You must make sure the amount of money that you put in is less than the amount of money that you take out. That idea is why, in general, profit can be problematic no matter what system that we're in. If we started all over from a blank slate and we build a business or we build a country on, on, on uh, capitalism, we'll have the same problem in a few hundred years. Right? I mean, Karl Marx pretty much predicted this a long time ago, right? <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a new idea. So, now that said, we're just basically laying a foundation of, of, of where I'm going um, here. I believe that it's okay to make a little bit of money. Oh, scratch that. I believe it's okay to make a lot of bit of money. <laughs> because that's, the, that's a common motivator among all of us. Nobody wants to be mediocre. No one wants to be mediocre. No one wants to be poor. I will, I will stretch and say people want to be above average. Always. Who don't want to be above average? So we have a problem. <laughs> he raised her hand over here. So one of the things that we must accept is that what's the end game? Is the end game to have more cooperatives operating in the U.S.? A more equal and fair and just system? Is that the end game? Government takeover. Government takeover. You know, when, when they were yelling, when they were yelling um, um, that we're turning into socialists and Obama was socialist because of the government bailout, right? Um, if, 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 he, if they would have paid that money back, it was, that's where it was going, right? I mean, the actual best thing to do was to just say, hey, we'll buy the business, right? But because our, our attachment to capitalism 
Um, it's like, we'll give you the money to save your business and you just give me the money back, right? Um, so, and so we take this model of, of, of startups and, and, and business in America. How do they fundraise? How did Tesla fundraise? How did uh, uh, Uber fundraise? How did WeWork fundraise? They didn't do this in a bubble. IPO is a liquidation event. That's when basically the, the, stake, the shareholders get their money back. Um, huh? Venture capitalists? Venture capitalists, okay? Venture capitalists, angel investors, right? Not one venture capitalist in America has enough money to put Uber where it is today. You're talking about thousands of venture capitalists that came together and said, we believe in Uber. Or we believe and we work. So we say venture capitalists, but like they're literally working in cooperation. Capitalists are working in cooperation much better than we are. Our goal is to cooperate, right? If I don't know how many people is at this conference right now, 200 people, throw a number out there, right? Um, if we wanted to say, you know, I'm gonna. I'm going to put aside fifty dollars a month for the for to fund our our uh, our next alderman. We'll be able to say, you know what? Here's a ten here's a ten thousand dollars that the other guy, the other capital is lobbying for. I'm okay with that because my, I know my end game. I know what I want to accomplish, and I know how the system exists. And if the system exists as bribing aldermen. The only way you're gonna get stuff done is playing the same game. Now, scratch that idea. I never said that. <laughs> Delete that off the tape. But in reality, I, I'm gonna take from my personal experience. So I, I, I live in Nicaragua. Um, I lived in Nicaragua for a, a long time. Um, right now, it's a sad situation. They're trying to overthrow their their government. Um, there's it's a very bad situation. But one thing I learned very early is that if I did not pay the administrators to push this paperwork through, it was going to take them a year or two to get it done. I learned that very early, right? Um, so I had to play the game that was being played. Understanding that what I am doing, as I am building fish farms in these small communities that um, don't have anybody else working for them. I'm building fish farms on coffee plantations where buyers are coming in and giving them half the market value for their beans. I'm giving them that extra income. So if I have to pay an extra thousand dollars to get this paperwork pushed through, fine. All right? Fine. But my motivation to help wasn't purely to pad my pockets. I mean, that was definitely a good motivator. But I felt good when I leave this farm and I know that I just gave a community of 200 people another career. And if we're able to sit in this room and say that we want to get something accomplished, we have to stop looking at the specifics of the situation and focus on the end goal. So when we look at um, uh, a, a worker co op who said, I'm not going to get a bank loan because it's making capitalists rich, right? Uh, but it's also providing 20 of your workers with equal pay. And if we live, until we live in a system where capitalism don't exist, the only way to really rapidly grow uh, 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 cooperatives in America is on top of these capitalist systems. Because we live in a world in which money rules. What we have in this room is manpower and brain power. And if we are able to put that manpower and brain power together, like capitalists, um, or, or like angel investors, or, or like these banks, then we can make stuff happen. When we start thinking in dollars and saying, you know what, yes, we want equal and fair pay for all, but it's going to take us coming together and focusing on fundraising and making money. Um, I, I think that's okay. Do anybody have a problem with that? So, now we're all in agreement, 
<laughs> okay. Now that we are all in agreement, we can talk about some specifics. One of the things that capitalists have done is taking the model of cooperation and made a ton of money on it. Uber, a bunch of independent people working on an app. They're independent, run their own schedule. Ideal, like an ideal situation for a cooperative, right? Ideal. For real? That was a joke, right? No. That wasn't a joke. Okay. <laughs> okay, so in this ideal situation, we've like, they've taken uh, uh, these cooperative ideas and they've made money on it. They've made, they built Uber. Um, they've like uh, built Grubhub, right? Um, these aren't these aren't unique ideas. There's been people in Chicago at 95th and Dan Ryan for decades providing unlicensed taxi service. <laughs> I'm serious. It's been there for I don't know. I left Chicago when I was 15, and, and I know it was there when I left Chicago. So I'm like 34 now. So um, so it's not, a, not the only thing that's different is that they they got the money. People stood together and. And, and gave them the money that they needed to get things done. So that said, there's two things that's really, really important right now. We have crowdfunding, where a company, who, who know uh, about um, the VRs? The VRs that you can buy with your Samsung phone? Mm -hmm. Right, or what is it called? It's called? Virtual reality. Yeah, the virtual, but there's a company. Uh, Oculus. Oculus, okay. Anyone know how Oculus started? They started on Kickstarter. They got $2 million in a matter of months on Kickstarter. People pre-ordering the Oculus. And they sold to Facebook three years later for $2 billion. Ooh. But Kickstarter was started by capitalists to utilize the ability of people standing together. So Kickstarter, in reality, should have been started by people like us, people in this room, utilizing these digital tools to get going. How many people here have started a co-op, attempted to fundraise for their co-op model um, on Kickstarter or, or crowdfunding platforms? One. 90 people, 90 percent of you guys should have raised your hand. <laughs> Truly, because that is one avenue in which people are willing to donate to a cause without the expect of equity investing, right? Um, so that's something that we really, really need to look at. Everybody in this room, if there's anything that you take from, from this conference when you're, I don't wanna say this because I kind of feel like it's, it's bad to do anything else, but if there's one thing that you take from this conference is that you need to learn about crowdfunding. We need to learn about crowdfunding. And he told me I only had a few minutes left. So finally, I'm going to just go over um, this Main Street Ownership Act. Um, this, the, 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 okay, all right. Yeah, okay. So the Main Street Employee Ownership Act um, can be groundbreaking. Believe it or not, not a lot of businesses are funded by banks in America. Most businesses are funded by like credit cards, friend and family. But the ones that's funded by banks have a set process. If you go to a bank and say, I want to start a restaurant, they're going to tell you no. Basically, right? Um, I'm a strategic advisor. I've done it. I've advised it. Nope, don't work. You have a house that you can put up? Possibly, right? So when we go to a bank as a cooperative and say, we need a loan, and they say no, it's normal. It's not strictly because we're a cooperative. But if you go to a bank and you say, there's a restaurant there that's operating, been operating profitably for five years, and I want to buy that. The bank will look at you and say, well, bring me the financials. Because there's, proven, there's a proven model there. And as they talked about the, the, the ESOP law is based on conversions, that is one method that we can use to rapidly grow cooperatives in America. Instead of thinking about building a new co-op, we can go into these businesses that's about to close with proven financial reports 
and say, you know what, we're going to consider taking over this and converting this into a co-op. Even the, even the cooperative-centric uh, uh, loan bodies like... Um, uh, no, not credit unions, not credit unions. There's one in St. Paul that was here. Yeah, share capital. Mark Fitch. It's like, yeah. Huh? Yeah. And he was like, you know what? Yeah, we, we are much happier funding conversions. Right? Much happier. Less risk. Right? Cooperatives on paper is definitely less risky than capitalist structures. We know that. Because we've experienced that. These bankers aren't trained that way. There's a risk management manual that they know, I know, and if I base all of my decisions on this risk management manual, I won't fund cooperatives either, right? That's just a part of the education system. That's the way it is now, right? Except that's the way it is, and we figure out how to get around it, right? We figure out what tools exist now that allow us to walk into a <coughs> bank and get this funding. So ESOPs are not really, they call it employee ownership, on the surface, it looks like employee ownership. But in reality, it's essentially a retirement plan. It's governed by retirement law. The new law that's coming down is making it more accessible to cooperatives. So a basic structure of the ESOP, anyone know about ESOPs? Okay, so the basic structure of ESOPs is that there's, when we say companies, you gotta remember that the company is an entity in itself, right? The shareholders just own the company. They're the they occupy the building and they own and control the money and everything else. So ESOP comes along, ESOP plan or ESOP trust, which is a trust is basically a document. Um, an ESOP can get a loan from a bank to buy an existing company and use this company as collateral. So an ESOP basically can buy a company, control all of the company's shares, and pay back the loan. The, the trust, anyone, you guys follow? Okay, tell me if you're not following. So, the ESOP, the employees are the main benefactors of the ESOP. Once the loan is paid back to the bank, as the loan is paid back, those shares trickle down to the employees. The biggest issue with ESOPs right now, when it comes to cooperatives, is that you can't just take money out, like if you're a cooperative owner, right? Well, the more profitable the business is, the more money you can put into your, your, your bank account. In ESOPs, traditionally, you don't see that money until you leave. And if you take that money out of the, if you, if you take that, because it's governed by retirement laws, what happens when you take your early retirement? You lose a chunk of that money, right? So that's the problem traditionally with ESOPs. Although it's a good, good avenue, um, there's still specific issues. So the law, the Main Street Employee Opportunity Act, Employee Ownership Act, basically says that now employees, this is what they're pushing for, right? Because this, this, on the surface, the act is just guiding, saying that we must do this, not that we are going to do this right now. It says, come up with a plan to do this. So um, basically, this, this, the law says employees can now, instead of ESOPs, employees would be able to use the company to... Uh, as collateral. Also, it says five, three. Okay. Also, it says uh, I'm usually the guy that's putting up fingers, right? <laughs> also, this law says. Um, also, this law says that um, when it comes to like ESOPs is very expensive. Traditionally, seventy-five thousand, hundred thousand, two hundred thousand to form. So that makes these small ten person. Uh, of shops like incapable of funding that. So now what they're pushing for is that for the SBA to willing to be able to finance up to $80,000 of that transition cost. That basically means that this five person restaurant will have enough money to pay for the legal fees associated with converting to an ESOP. Right? It also says let's make ESOPs more available, um, let's make this model more available to cooperatives. What do we have to do to allow cooperatives to go into the bank and get that SBA loan guarantee? Which they guarantee 80%, the bank will get 80% of the money back. 
And, and so that's, that's what's being worked on now. Although this, this Employee Ownership Act has passed, there's no real set processes in place. They're basically been said, hey, we need to do this, and there's a certain amount of time um, that they have to get it done. So there's a lot of people working on the details of this. But what that means for cooperatives, and I'm going to end. Um, I'll make a good example of anybody who has a panel next. <laughs> for anybody who has a panel next. So what that basically means is that we will have access to the same funding that a small business have access to. That same SBA loan guarantee will be the, will, that, that capitalists use to open up their, their restaurant or their, their grocery store. We will have that same opportunity as well. Okay? Do we have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Go ahead. Are you familiar with the uh, uh, Small Business Investment Corporation model? The SBI, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, that, that certainly lends itself that with, uh, with the Main Street Act, it's going to lend that sort of uh, funding open to cooperatives too, as far as that. Maybe yes, it's just the SBICs are investor back. So they are really trying to, in SBICs, they're trying to uh, stimulate like angel investors and social impact investors to invest in, um, in dying communities, essentially. Um, and, and that's what their, their purpose is. And again, remember that if it's a for-profit investor, they're extractive, mm -hmm. regardless, right? It's an extractive process. Any for-profit model is extractive. The only thing that matters, and I'll end on this, the only thing that matters with profit, in my opinion, is where the profit goes. Does it go back into the community, or does it go to in the chest of somebody in the 1% or a bank? So, and if it goes back into the community, make billions. If it goes to, to Wall Street, you can have a few pennies. Mine. Okay. Any other questions? No. Okay. So. Thank you.